my name is Ty Shipman. Welcome to Security After Death. Um, so how technical is my audience really quick on a scale of one to five, how comfortable you are with technical stuff? Okay, so about half the audience, that's fine. So this, whoops, wrong way. Got to push the right buttons. Um, I'm a security auditor. I work for Compliance Point. I've been doing this for a number of years. Uh, before that, I was a, in IT and security and e-commerce and mobile and stuff like that. So I have a lot of different skill sets. And uh, I love to scuba dive, so you'll see some things about that. This talk is dedicated to my best friend, Eric Jacobs, who died um, last March. And his widow asked me to break into his computers because she needed files that were on his systems to do stuff, specifically passwords to manage his digital life and close it down. So this is a direct result of that experience. Uh, so in the past, whoops. Okay, so my clicker here is not working, so just give me a second. Sorry about this. So the problem definition that we're going to fix is, how many passwords do you have? I've got to turn this off. This is really bad. So in the past, when you died, your spouse only needed your uh, a death certificate and a marriage license and maybe your mother's maiden name, and were able to close down all the accounts and manage everything at the bank and stuff like that. Today, that's not necessarily true because there is no way to recover passwords from like Facebook or Google or Yahoo and all the dozens of other uh, digital environments that you currently have. So the problem space that I see is, how many passwords do you have? One. Show of hands, one, just one password. Two passwords, three passwords, 10, 20, 30, 50, 100, 200, four. Okay, so 400 passwords. Yeah, I'm about 385. So how do you store these things? Uh, that's what we're gonna talk about in the first half. In the second half, we're gonna talk about how to share them. And then a third, th uh, third part of the talk, we're going to talk about how to recover from a catastrophic problem. So where do you store your passwords? Well, your brain. It's very safe, but like me, my brain's like Swiss cheese. I forget a lot of things. On sticky notes, they get glue, uh, black books, files on your computer, maybe encrypted files on your computer. Uh, how about on your phone? Well, that's really great. Now they're with you, but you can't copy paste. Um, you're encrypted on a phone, that's horrible because now you have to type in some big long password to get something that you can't copy paste. So a uh, single password, it's called super federation. It's a really bad idea. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So how do you fix that? Well, you kind of combine all these things to get the best of all the worlds and that's called a password manager. And we're gonna talk about that. Super federation, how many people have seen these things show up? Super convenient. They're really dangerous. If somebody cracks your Facebook account, they own you. There are better ways to achieve the same um, convenience. One of them is called the password manager or password vault or a key ring by multiple names. These are applications that are specifically designed to hold your digital life behind a super password that only you know. And then you can use those to access your digital sites that you're going to, Facebook, Twitter, Google, AWS, all those things. Not all key rings or password managers are created the same. Lots of features. So you really need to understand your feature set that you have to have. Browsers have password managers built into them. They're not protected by a password and they're not encrypted. In Eric's case, that's how he recovered his uh, digital life. He was using password managers on his browser. So I was able to get all those, give them to his widow, and she was able to close down all the accounts. So to find out more about password managers, go to Google, search for password managers. Um, try them out before getting one. Get the free versions. 
Um, there are a multitude of functionality in these password managers. You have to figure out what you need. Uh, look at the open source products. If you're going to buy a password manager, only spend what you have to, because you can update later. All of these password managers have export functions and import functions, so you can move between password managers as your requirements change. You want to look at things like good password randomization, uh, force complexity of your site passwords, so uppercase, lowercase, all those things, password lengths, automatic rotation, if they've got that functionality, MFA, multi-factor authentication support, some are automatic capture and sign-in. So you go to a new web, web page, you sign into it because you have to create an account. The password manager will, in fact, in fact uh, grab that password data and store it. And then you can use it later on for auto-submission. Uh, there are other systems that support auto-submission in the shells for an SSH terminal and applications. The vault, many of them have choices for algorithm support. Maybe you don't want to use Blowfish. You want to use an ASC 256 or 512. Uh, if the master, master password expires, maybe you want nagging to help you rotate it on a consistent basis so that it remains secure. Uh, some of them have differences between the admin user and the user for the site passwords. Those things are happening. So here's an example of good randomization in my password manager that I use. So you can choose the number of characters, you can choose how many digits, how many symbols that you choose in these things. These are really nice so you don't have to figure out the patterns. Your human brain will manifest on a pattern. If somebody figures out your pattern, they'll be able to crack your site. So use random passwords. Uh, if you're not using a multi-factor on the site, 20 characters or more. Uh, you don't care how long it is and how complex it is because you're never going to remember these. You're going to store them in your password manager. Your password manager is going to uh, keep them. So multi-factor authentication. There's uh, the Google Authenticator, which is a one-time password. It's free. It's a NIST level 2 addition to security. NIST level 1 is just the password. NIST level 2 is the one-time token generators like the RSA and the Google Authenticator, and YubiKey is NIST 3. Um, so that's for high security sites. So think about the multi-factor authentication systems you want to use. Uh, sharing passwords. Features that are necessary in a business. It's great for a home. Um, allows you to share passwords safely. Um, I use them to share bank passwords with my wife. I've created a group. She gets the bank password. If I change the bank password or she changes it, it just goes into the password manager. I don't have to worry about the update. In a business, you have a support team that needs access to a uh, you know, remote site. You can have one person control the password. Everybody else can just use it. Those are things that happen in the password managers. Uh, LastPass is an example that has this kind of functionality. They actually have a feature called Use Only, where the person who is entering it on the website can only select it to say Insert, and it just fills in the username and password fields. They never actually see the password in clear text. And then the normal Read, Write, and Use. So what features might you want? Um, you might want to store other things in your password manager besides your digital credentials. Passport IDs, driver's license, credit cards, pictures, PKI, uh, keys, all these things should go into your password manager. Anything that you consider that you want to be secret. Uh, other features, tags so you can group them, multiple URLs are handy. Uh, if you're going to different sites that you're using some kind of federation, maybe like a company internal site, you can do all these things with. Uh, auto submit versus wait is really important. Uh, some systems have the ability when you choose it that it will go and insert the username and password and click the submit button for you. Others are username, password, and it waits because you're using a two-factor authentication system. You have to put in the two-factor system 
uh, one-time password, and then you have to manually click the uh, submit button to make it all happen. Uh, hack alerts are very nice. Uh, in 2017, there were 230 million passwords leaked on eight sites that were hacked that we know about. In 2016, 579 million passwords were leaked. It was kind of shocking when I started adding up all these things. So it's very likely that your password on one of these sites has been leaked and you probably don't know about it. The password managers maintain publicly disclosed hacks and disclosure lists and they'll alert you to the fact that your password has been leaked on a site so you can change it before the company does a revocation on your password and forces you to do it. Uh, you need integration into Azure, AWS, handy things to have. Other policies, uh, IP restrictions. I once set a password restriction that said, you can't use my password manager for my business if you're in China. You have to be in the United States or in Canada. I assumed anybody who went to China, and we had an office in China, they used it in China the Chinese army would get my password to my AWS system and I didn't want them to have that. So I just said, you can't use it. So things to think about. Audit is a really important thing if you're running a business. Uh, repositories, where should your vault live? On your local machine or off in the cloud? If so in the cloud, where in the cloud? What country? <laughs> important things to consider uh, or both. I like it that way both local and uh, remote. Uh, browser integration. You want to make sure that the browsers that you use support the password manager that you're gonna integrate with. Not everybody is equal there. Uh, multiple vaults and APIs. Uh, user management functionality. So here are some open source password managers. Uh, KeePass has been around for a very long time. I think 2000, 8, 2009 is when they came out. They have hundreds of features and they work on just about every platform known to man. It's an open source, so somebody, if it's not there, somebody writes a plugin, donates it, and then it's there. Tons of features. Some of these things are very, very minimalistic. Uh, some of these systems are minimalistic that you need to deal with, so you need to choose your password manager carefully. Um, Commercial systems, Dashline, LastPass, those are ones that I have experience with. I'm not endorsing those. It's just I can tell you that they have some functionality that's very nice. There's a cost to these. The way you read this data set, because it's kind of complicated, is $0 for one user or $40 for multiple sites and platforms, $48 for an enterprise version of Dashlane, or you can go all the way down to Zoho for $84 for an enterprise license. So choose the password manager based on the feature set, pay the price. These are all the features they have and all the platforms they work on. Again, figure out your requirements, get the password manager that meets the requirements. And then change if you don't like. Recovery of the master password. So in Eric's case, he never told his password to get into his computers to his wife. And then he died. And that's where I had to break in. So if you become incapacitated, how are you going to deal with how is your spouse or your executor on your will or your mom and dad or your significant other going to deal with that? How are they going to recover the password uh, to get into your digital vault? We'll talk about that in the latter, this last part of the talk. Uh, how should the recovery happen? Dual control. Sometimes you want to have your master password split between multiple people. You want to force uh, collusion in this case. Usually collusion is thinking uh, of a bad situation. In this case, you want collusion. So we'll talk about dual controls. And you want to make it easy for non-technical people. Some commercial platforms have password recovery systems in place. Uh, dual control seems to be an issue on the ones that I reviewed. They don't have a duality requirement, so it's just a single person get your password. 
you know, what about your updates, your master password? How do you tell these people, you know, your spouse or your, who your executor is going to be if you change your master password? My master password changes every month. Uh, it should remain secret until. That's a really good requirement in the recovery process, and we'll talk about that. And again, as I said, collusion should be a requirement. Uh, you trust a single person. You can trust a single person. Uh, these are good for uh, businesses. You tell your boss or your manager uh, or a lawyer. Uh, but what if they become incapacitated? Now you're kind of in trouble, especially if you're traveling in the same car and you get hit and both of you pass away. You're, now there's, there's two cleanups to happen. So now you go to two people. So how do you sync those? And how do they come together? What happens if one of them gets incapacitated? You know, it, it's an on and on and on problem. Uh, so there's a way to solve this. It's called generic secret sharing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what you want is a recovery system that requires multiple people to come together that have part of your password to recreate the full password. So, you know, it's a, it's a cooking class that has to come together and everybody brings their own little part of the cake. Uh, these systems need to be highly available and they need to be confidential. Uh, they're storing sensitive information. Typically, they store launch codes, bank accounts, and the password to your personal stuff. So all important things. We're going to focus on one specific sharing scheme called Samir's Secret Share. There's another one called Blakely's, uh, which I'm not going to cover today. I am going to give URLs at the end of this um, presentation that will point you to all these things, and you can look up all the math behind them if you care to do so or more about them. So Samir's Secret Share. Uh, Adi Samir from RSA fame published this solution in 1979, so quite a long time ago. Basically, you're taking a polynomial, you know, it's like x to the second or plus x to the third plus x to the fourth to solve a problem, which are points on a graph which turn out to be parts of the password. Uh, you can look at the website that I'm going to reference at the end to really understand this. It's the most efficient algorithm. One of the key factors is that the shard or the share piece is no longer than the secret itself, which is important for input control. So if you have a 20 character password, the piece that you're gonna give to your lawyer is gonna be 20 characters long. The number of trusts and the number of shares can be large or small, and we'll talk about that. For instance, <coughs> if you do a two of three scheme, which is Two people have to come together out of three shards. You have three combinations to recover that password. A two of five is a recovery of 10 different ways. A three of five is also 10 ways, but you need more collusion. So it's a more confidential system. Uh, so here's an example of an input of Samir Share. This is the site that I referenced. I'll give you the at the end. So I type in my favorite password. Not really. And I'm doing a two of three split. So I'm ending up with this gobbledygook at the bottom because the length of this gobbledygook is equal to the input size, so it's quite large. And now I'm going to recreate the password. So from the previous page, you saw that I did a two of three. So I need two pieces to recover the password, at least two pieces. So if I have just one piece, I just get gobbledygook, which means the shard itself doesn't lead to the password. There's nothing in the shard that tells you the password. You need to put two or three pieces in there. So it's very nice because now you've got multiple people who know different parts. Any of them individually is useless. Coming together, they recreate your password. So 
So here we do a one of one. This is nice if you just want to hide the clear text password. You can use the same system to create just one single shard. So the person doesn't know what the clear text password is. It's just a bunch of gobbledygook for them to type in. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm saying I'd like two shares, but I only want one person to come together. So it's a nice way of just splitting the password. What you're seeing at the very bottom of the screen is the passwords are almost identical except for the first three characters. So it doesn't really provide differences. It's just the way the, the mathematical model works. But now each one of these pieces work as a password to find your password. So it's a really convenient way to have a uh, two-person share with the same password. Each of them think they have their own secret, but it's really just one password behind the scene. Okay. So where are you going to use these? Any place where you want dual control. So here are all the use cases that you might want to think about. So we're going to look at a in a minute, we're going to look at something here. So now what do you do at the end of this? Marvin, what do we do now? Yeah. Take a breath. This afternoon, go and get a password manager and install it if you don't already use one. Pick any one of them. Put the repository on the cloud. Uh, there are a lot of options there. Uh, you can put them in Google, you can put them on um, Azure, Dropbox, any of the file sharing systems, uh, Microsoft. Uh, save your existing passwords into them. Uh, try it out, you can always switch later, especially because a lot of them, even the commercial ones, have free trials uh, for one user. Uh, and then use the Samir Secret Share to create a recovery path. It doesn't have to be very complicated. So take and write some instructions, put them into a folder, use a zip that creates a encrypted file. Take that file and put it on a file share system. Take the password, use Samir secret share to make two of three or three of five, whatever your combination should be, and share the passwords, but give the people that you're sharing it, your custodians, access to the shared file. So if something happens to you, and tell them the names of the other people, right? So now you've got a way to recover the master password should you become incapacitated. So in conclusion, I was able to break into Eric's system and recover the passwords only because he was using a non-secure password manager. I was very lucky. I was very bummed that I lost my best friend, but I was very lucky in that sense. So how do you store passwords securely? Well, the obvious answer is use a password manager. You should get away from writing passwords on a piece of paper or trying to use a pattern. All of those things are breakable. Password managers are very easy to use and they're free to share passwords. Use groups or different vaults to share your passwords with people that you have to share them with for sites. Not your master password, but your site passwords. And then before you become incapacitated, use Samir Secret Share to create a recovery system. So if something happens to you, somebody has the ability to get in there and clean up after you. Uh, any questions? Yeah, Richard. Uh, you mentioned YubiKey. Uh, you know, for the multi-factor. Yeah. Can, can you use two YubiKeys associated uh, just in case you lose one or one that stops functioning? 
most YubiKeys have the ability to clone the certificate data, and those are, that those are either outside the password managers or they're built into the password managers to clone them. Some have that support built in, and some you just use a tool to cl clone your YubiKey. You can also have multiple YubiKeys control access to different vaults. So you can have you know, a low security, a medium security, and a high security, and then those things which you just want to die and take to your grave with. So, you know, I use uh, two UB keys. So. Thanks. We had one more question over here and then up to the front. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I use a password manager myself, uh, but they make themselves a very juicy target because of centralization of your entire life. How do you recommend limiting the risk if your entire password manager is compromised? Choose a strong initial secret key so that it doesn't happen. If, you're, if your entire password manager is corrupt, you know, taken and broken, um, at least you know the sites you have to go and change very quickly. You know, you're not gonna forget something. Um, the password managers typically are storing the passwords in a, in a file that is encrypted with, you know, ASC 256 or 512 or Blowfish. So the work factor to, you know, twist those out is pretty high. Uh, so you have time if you know that it's been compromised. Um, the whole idea is, you know, to choose you know, like use two-factor, right? That's a solution. Uh, use a one-time, uh, an OTP, like a Google uh, Authenticator or an RSA key or a YubiKey for access to your password manager. That helps a lot. Uh, but then just choose a good, strong password along the way, you know, 16 characters or 20. And realize your master password uh, doesn't have to be completely random. It can be a phrase that you can remember. <laughs> So, one second, we've got to get the mic to you. Uh, aside from uh, securing your master password to make sure they can't break into the overall uh, key management store, um, what kinds of things should you be looking for in terms of the security practices of the password management, uh, the, the company that produces the software for the password management? Because um, there are various attacks that can disclose individual site keys um, or, you know, once you're signed into that password manager, other exploits against the browser extensions, et cetera, yes. like that. So, you know, most of them use JavaScript um, to be able to uh, inject things into the fields. Um, there have been exploits found against some of them. Um, you know, there's other possible ways that um, I, I know that some browser makers are talking about APIs in the future to make a more secure way of dealing with that instead of exposing through injected JavaScript. Um, just what, what, what are your thoughts on that part of uh, the equation? So um, basically the question is how do you stop uh, some kind of injection attack on a browser from getting access to either the site password or you know, in the worst case scenario, back into your password manager. Um, there are, there's a, um, there is a project underneath active development now between Google and, I want to say LastPass, to create an API so that, uh, at least on the Android phone, there's a back channel to get the passwords instead of going through a browser. I suspect that you're gonna see something like that uh, on all browsers in the future uh, for better integration to specifically stop that exploit. But I don't know what's happening. Um, the other way that I would say to do that on highly sensitive sites is use a combination on that site of a one-time password along with the password that's in the system because then you have to crack both. You have to crack, you know, 
the password manager, you have to inject and you have to take over the phone or get you know, the one-time password uh, master system. Do you know if any of the password managers support a flag that says whether or not that password can be autofilled versus something that you have to copy and paste manually? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the idea that um, you basically set it up not to auto submit. And so you can just, you know, go and disable the URL so that it doesn't recognize the site, so it doesn't do an autofill. And then you can go and copy, you know, the password from the system into the page if you want to do that. So that's a, uh, a way to achieve those, uh, that goal. In the back, we'll come back to you in just a second. Go ahead, all the way back. You've uh, recommended two-factor authentication for using sites. However, if you, say, disappear and your two-factor authentication is located on your phone, providing a password or master password to access your password vault is a little bit incomplete to access sites that might be guarded by two-factor. How would you recommend somehow being able to provide 2FA or MFA keys to those people you've trusted to your recovery in the case of your disappearance or untimely demise? I'm sorry, I didn't fully comprehend the question. Sure, so if I disappear and I have my yeah. phone with me ah. and I provide my password to recover for those people to take care of right. my affairs, they can't access, say, my Facebook site, which is guarded by 2FA with Google Authenticator on my phone. Okay. How does one get around that or somehow provide another entrance for sites that are protected by two-factor? Perfect. Um, so the idea is that if you're using a one-time, if you're using Google Authenticator, you have to initialize the Google Authenticator when you first enroll on that on the site. And there's a GIF that shows up. Take a screenshot of the GIF, put that in the password manager. Doesn't that expire once it's used the first time though? No. Does not? No. Okay. That GIF uh, initializes the clock with a random sequence so that the time and this random check form the six digit uh, token. And so those never expire. Uh, I've had to go through that exact, it was a learning experience. I lost my phone, it got stolen actually. And uh, my Google Authenticator was on it. I had nine Google Authenticated systems. I had to have another administrator log in, remove the two-factor <laughs> administration, and I had to go through the whole reinitialization process. And then at some point, my clock got out of sync for some reason and one of them stopped working. So I just went through and just did the reinitialization. So it was a learned sequence for me. So I can tell you it absolutely works. Yes, up front. Wait for the mic, please. Uh, how do you apply the Shamir group? Because I noticed, I just noticed you just shown that how to generate, but how do you apply it to like key pass or stuff like that? Um, so the, the Samir share is the recovery process. It's not inside of key pass. It's an external process. Okay. So once you set up your password manager and you put in, you know, your password to access your password manager, let's say it's just password one. You take password one, go to the site, generate the two shards, share the shards, write some instructions to tell people this is my access password to my share, to my you know, password vault, and you're done. So it's not an integrated step, it's an out, out of bounds step. We can take this offline, I'll explain, you know. Any other questions? Okay, thank you for your time. Um, all these slides, you can take a picture of this uh, slide here if you need to. It has all the relevant information. I'll leave that up. And then this is on my LinkedIn page, and you can just go there, as well as the OWASP is publishing all the slides when they publish the video. Uh, take a picture of that page. My LinkedIn will have these slides in about two hours, and you can go and get them. And you're always welcome to email me and ask me questions about this stuff. I don't have a problem sharing. Any other questions? We're done. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you very much.